Greetings from Cooperstown, New York, side of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. This would have normally been a Hall of Fame weekend 2020. That cannot take place because of circumstances going on here in the United States and around the world. But we do want to, throughout this weekend, honor our class of 2020. And today we will look deeper into the career and the life of one of our new Hall of Famers, the late Marvin Miller, part of our class of 2020. Coming up a little bit later on in the program, we will interview someone who knew Marvin Miller, uh, talked to him a number of times, Hall of Famer Dave Winfield from the class of 2001. Uh, that'll be coming up in a few minutes from now, but right now, we're gonna begin with a presentation about Marvin Miller, what he did for the Players Association, uh, his career in baseball, and the improvements that he was able to gain for baseball during those years. If you go back in baseball history, back to the 1950s and 60s, many players outside of a few superstars really struggled to make decent money in the game. The players had few rights. There was no such thing as free agency, little chance to appeal suspensions or fines, and no opportunity to turn down trades. The current players organization, the Major League Baseball Players Association, had been formed in 1954, but it remained fairly weak for a number of years, at least until a very important development in 1966. And that is when the players hired Marvin Miller to head up their organization. Miller had previously worked for the United Steelworkers Union and had served as that group's leading economist and negotiator. Now in 1967, just his second year on the job with the Players Association, Marvin Miller negotiated on behalf of the players for a raise in minimum salary. So that was one of their early tangible improvements. Then in 1970, something even more significant happened. Players, under the guidance of Miller, won the right to have their grievances heard before an independent arbitrator rather than the commissioner of baseball. Historically, the commissioner of baseball has been paid by the league's owners. So when a dispute would come before the commissioner, there might be that tendency to rule in favor of the owners, not the players. By having an independent arbitrator, uh, this gave the Players Association uh, a bit of a fairer chance of getting a favorable decision. In talking about Marvin Miller and his impact on the Players Association, it's really critical to talk about the relationships that he had with certain players, players that were willing to challenge the system. And one of those players was Kurt Flood. In 1970, Kurt Flood, star center fielder for the St. Louis Cardinals, teamed up with Marvin Miller and together they challenged baseball's long-standing reserve system. Now Flood had played for the Cardinals for 12 seasons. And then in 1969, the Cardinals traded him to the Philadelphia Phillies. For a variety of reasons, Flood was against making the switch from St. Louis to Philadelphia. Flood's main objection was that he did not want to be treated like a piece of property. And he stated that in a letter to the commissioner of baseball, Bowie Kuhn. We're going to read from that letter. After 12 years in the major leagues, I do not feel that I'm a piece of property to be bought and sold irrespective of my wishes. I believe that any system that produces that result violates my basic rights as a citizen and is inconsistent with the laws of the United States. Later in the letter, Flood went on to say, it is my desire to play baseball in 1970, and I am capable of playing. I have received a contract from the Philadelphia club, but I believe I have the right to consider offers from other clubs before making any decision. Now, let's highlight some of the words that were said in that letter from Kurt Flood to the commissioner. Again, after 12 years of being in the major leagues, I do not feel I'm a piece of property to be bought and sold irrespective of my wishes. Later in an interview with famed broadcaster Howard Cosell, Flood was even more direct, if you will, in his complaint about the situation in baseball. 
And he was quoted in the interview with Cosell as saying, a well-paid slave is nonetheless a slave. Now, this was a controversial remark for the time. A lot of fans did not like the comparison of being a baseball player to being a slave. But Flood was basically trying to make the point that although he had the benefits of being a baseball player, he could not pick and choose his employer as most employees could do at the time. He really had no veto power over trades. He had no ability to choose on his own what team he wanted to play for. So that was really his point. Now, in response, Commissioner Kuhn wrote a letter back to Kurt Flood, basically telling him that it was improper that he was acting in this way. And he ordered Flood to play for the Philadelphia Phillies or simply not play at all in 1970. Well, Flood chose the latter option. He chose not to play and he also decided to sue Major League Baseball. So here we have a document from the case. It was called Flood versus Kuhn. The case started in federal district court and it reached the Supreme Court in 1972. The court actually sided with Major League Baseball in ruling on Flood versus Kuhn. So on the surface, this was a loss for Kurt Flood and for the Players Association because Marvin Miller had given his full support to Kurt Flood. You know, he had told Flood that it's gonna be difficult, it's gonna be hard to win, but you have my full support throughout the trial, throughout the entire process. So they end up losing the case to Major League Baseball, but that's only on the surface. In reality, Flood and Miller, they had taken the first step in a process that would shift the balance of power between owners and players. Although no active players had decided to attend the flood trial, the court case did galvanize many of the players. Some of them became angry with the way that baseball had treated Kurt Flood. The case also helped change public opinion, both with the media and with the fans. Media and fans became more sympathetic at that point to the struggles of players. The Supreme Court also came out with an interesting statement as part of its ruling. The Supreme Court said that it was the job of Congress and not the court to change the reserve clause. Now the reserve clause essentially bound players perpetually, year after year after year, to their original major league teams. But in issuing their ruling, the Supreme Court basically saying, the reserve clause, it's outdated, it needs to be changed. The court also recommended to major league owners that they consider making changes to the reserve clause in the near future before having changes thrust upon them by the American Congress. Now, even before he lost the case, Flood's career did come to an end. While his situation did not turn out well personally, he struggled in his final season with the Washington Senators. He certainly did set the stage for future success on the part of the players in their continuing battle over the reserve clause. Three years after the Supreme Court decision comes down, these two players, they make another change. On the left, you have Andy Messersmith, and on the right, Dave McNally, two veteran pitchers. So they decide to challenge the reserve clause by playing the entire 1975 season without signing their contracts. So they refused to sign their contracts, which had automatically been renewed. They played without signing a contract. Their contention was that once they had played that entire 1975 season without a signed contract, the reserve clause would essentially be nullified and the players would then become free agents after the 1975 season. Well, they filed a grievance against Major League Baseball. And remember going back to what Marvin Miller did early on in his career as a head of the Players Association, he was able to get Major League owners to agree that grievances would be decided by an independent arbitrator. So an independent arbitrator named Peter Seitz looked at the McNally-Messersmith fight over the reserve clause. 
And here's what happened. Sites agreed with Messerschmitt and McNally. And he said, yes, their contracts are now null and void because they played the entire season without signing the documents. He granted free agency to both of these veteran pitchers, Messerschmitt and McNally. Well, the major league owners were now fearful that all players could become free agents if they did the same thing and played an entire year without signing a contract. So the owners felt like they needed to negotiate a new working agreement with the Players Association. And that's what they did. The owners and players sat down. They negotiated a compromise that would permanently alter the reserve clause. The reserve clause would still exist, but only for the first six years that a player was under contract to his team. After six years of service time, each player could then become a free agent. Now, free agency, that is something that gives much more power to the players. The players now have the right to bargain and negotiate with other teams for their services. Free agency allows players to sign multi-year contracts. Up until then, most players signed one, maybe two-year deals, but long-term deals, five, six years, almost unheard of. Well, the effect of free agency on players' salaries has been one of the most notable and tangible results of free agency. And certainly Marvin Miller had a huge impact here because he was involved in the negotiation for this new free agent system. Consider that when Marvin Miller took over the players' union in 1966, the average player salary was 19 thousand dollars. That was the average salary, $19,000, 1966. When Miller retired in 1982, 16 years after he took over, the average salary had climbed to 240000 So it went from 19000 to 240000 And if you look at players in Major League Baseball today, well, salaries have continued to climb. The average salary 2020 is about $4.2 million average salary. And the minimum salary for 2020, though it is prorated in a shortened season, is $555,000. So that is a glimpse at what Marvin Miller was able to do from 1966 to 1982 as the head of the Major League Baseball Players Association. We will now talk more about the career and the legacy of the late Marvin Miller with Hall of Famer Dave Winfield. That'll be coming up momentarily. We continue to look back at the career and the legacy of one of our new Hall of Famers, part of the class of 2020, Marvin Miller. We're very glad to have with us today somebody who knew Marvin. Uh, he's a member of the Hall of Fame's class of 2001, hit 465 home runs during a 22-year career, part of a world championship team with the Toronto Blue Jays. We welcome Dave Winfield to the program. Dave, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Bruce, and uh, thank you for all you Hall of Fame listeners. Glad to talk to you today. Dave, you first signed a professional contract with the San Diego Padres. You were drafted in 1973. Uh, by then, Marvin Miller was certainly established as the head of the Players Association. Tell us what you remember, Dave, about that first time that you met Marvin. Uh, the first time I met Marvin, um, I'm trying to determine if it, if it was uh, actually in New York at the very small diminutive offices of the Players Association. I was with my agent in uh, New York. Or if it was the first time we had a, uh, a regional players meeting in Anaheim. And um, I think the first time, I, the New York opportunity was more one-on-one. -on -one. Anaheim was, uh, it was, you know, a lot of guys there and I was virtually nobody then. <laughs> I was on the outer rings of the tables that were there. <laughs> what impressions did you come away with when you met Miller? Well, first of all, I was somewhat familiar with unions. Look, when a player who just played baseball and I went to the University of Minnesota, uh, when, when I came out of there, you're basically just growing up. And then all of a sudden, this is your professional career. 
And so I was somewhat familiar with unions because my aunt, uh, Wilma, was a, uh, a staunch leader in the teachers union back in St. Paul, Minnesota. So I was vaguely familiar with that. But I knew that um, the union was the representation of the players in their professional career. So um, the person that was the head of that, I wanted to know. I never knew I was going to play for a, a generation, you know, more than 20 years. Um, I never knew I would be confronted with so many issues that I was in baseball. I never knew I might be the highest paid player. I just knew that if this was my career. This was the leader of the union, which was uh, our representative. And I wanted to learn as much as I could about the organization, the people who preceded me, and the person who, of course, was running it. So I'm an inquisitive person by nature. And uh, I saw Marvin. He, he, he was a diminutive guy, small. Uh, back then, in the, in the early 70s, you know, people would smoke a lot. You know, so they're smoking cigarettes and, and rooms and all that kind of stuff. But he was quiet spoken. He was very intelligent. He was very knowledgeable about uh, labor issues. You could tell that from the beginning. And his particular style, I won't call it a style. It was just his, his nature. He was soft spoken. Uh, he had the, you know, the, uh, the, the peppered, you know, hair, you know, white and black. And he had experience with the, uh, steel workers so we were just bound to listen and he was in his qu own quiet spoken way people were drawn in you know sometimes when people speak softly they're drawn in <laughs> and uh we were drawn in and uh uh and looking years to the future we were we just happened to be we appointed or assigned up the guy who was the right person at the right time to lead players into new lands that they've never been before. So you knew right away, this is the guy, this is the right person. Well, I didn't know what was going to happen or what we'd have to go through in all these subsequent years, but uh, we were pleased to have someone representing us with some experience. So it was Marvin and Dick Moss, who was our um, internal uh, legal counsel. And so, um, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. You look at it and you say, now, man, we made the right choice. Look at it, where we are compared to other sports. And Marvin led the way. You mentioned very quiet, soft-spoken. Did he ever lose his temper during negotiations? Did he even occasionally raise his voice? Never. He wasn't a, a table-pounding kind of a guy. He spoke with reason. He spoke with uh, facts. He spoke... Um, in a way that would give you the confidence to go forward. But you know, yeah. another intelligent, I won't say intelligent way to handle things, but he, he was a leader that would enable players and push players to be involved, to speak up, to participate, to lead, to give him direction. You know, it wasn't, this is, I know the answers, and this is, hey, we're going over the hill right now, guys. Let's go. The players, once they became educated and involved, they became activated. They knew they were working on their own behalf. So mm -hmm. he always encouraged the players to speak up, to participate. So it, it, it may be completely different than anyone would think. Well, the leader is out there and, and we, had, we have to follow him like, like sheep or lemmings over the cliff. That's not the case. He always empowered the players and, and let them know that if they – first of all, understood issues and they stuck together and they believed in it and they stuck together, you could get anything that you need and want. And he was all about fairness, the treatment, the fairness for the players because we're starting at a disadvantage. Without representation, um, Major League Baseball, the owners never had to really sit down with the players. You weren't obligated by the Labor Relations Board or anything like that. But once we had representation and formed a, the players' union, the organization, then they were obligated to sit down and discuss and bargain and be honest and fair, even though that wasn't, that's not always the case in any kind of bargaining or discussions. However, 
heretofore before Marvin, uh, they didn't have to sit down with us. And it, that's why everything stayed the same. I think players were making the minimum salary for something like 20 years in a row before Marvin came. Yeah. <laughs> so, and he made major changes. And just so I, I, I don't forget, because I, I don't know how much time we'll have to talk about it. When I came on in 1973, minimum salary was $15,000. You're a rookie. That's what you made. There were no multi-year contracts. There was no free agency. There was no arbitration. Yeah. There was no 401k. There were grievances all over the place that the teams didn't have to live up to. And, um, you know, the, the, the average salary, when I, when I finished, I think the average, the minimum salary, well, the average salary was uh, over a million for sure. And the top guys were making, I don't know, five, six, seven million. And so we came a long way. And um, I, I'll say this too, and we can get into the details, but I couldn't be more proud of, I, I was one of the players, I think I was number, we have numbers kind of assigned to us, like what were you? And I was about the 10,000, I think 974 player that ever played major league baseball so there probably been 60 percent more players after me but what we bargained for negotiated for and fought for and and got bruised and bumped and banged and and, and i went through six work stoppages i am more, couldn't be more proud of having been part of an organization that change the trajectory, the opportunities for players today. Uh, it wasn't just for us. We always knew it was for subsequent uh, players. And so when I'm working for the Players Association, as you see here, I always convey this to the players today. They have an obligation, not only for what they do or what they receive, but for the next generation of players. And I see it in so many so many of the guys, young and old. Dave, I never had the chance to meet or interview Marvin Miller. I have heard that he wasn't much of a baseball fan, at least at the beginning. Is that true? Yeah, I can't say that. Yeah, that's a very good question. I can't say. He certainly didn't have a bunch of uh, posters at his house, yeah. I'm sure, or anything like that. They, you know, they were in the, the, the office where, yeah. because we represented players. But he he just he was all uh, business. His focus was on yeah. improving working conditions and pay for the players. Yeah, yeah, but he definitely respected the players. There were always good players and people around, you know, business mind or um activist minded people. You know, you had guys like uh uh, uh Ted Simmons, you ask him quite you go Don Baylor, mm. uh, uh Winfield, uh um, man, I could go up and down, you know, more recently there were the, the Bobby Bonillas and, uh, and the, um, I, I just, there's too many to, but if you ever came by the players association office and you looked at the wall and all the plaques of the people that made significant contributions and, um, you, you go back to the, uh, when it was really, really tough. There were, um, oh man, I, I can't think of everybody's picture that's on the wall, but when things were really tough, Senator, um, he became a Senator in um, Kentucky. Oh, He's Jim in, Bunning. Yeah, Jim Bunning. Yeah. Um, the picture that threw Al Downing, um, you know, there were so many people that you wouldn't necessarily know what they did off of the field you say oh he was a great pitcher or oh they were a great hitter but um they committed a lot of their life they risked a lot uh, put it on the line for the next generation and so uh, getting not to get too far away from I, I would just say no marvin wasn't really focused on uh i mean he just respected and tried to help the guys maximize their careers it wasn't so much 
who he was pulling for if you're in New York with Mets or Yankees or yeah. Phillies or something like that. Dave, when you became a free agent after the 1980 season, did you talk to Miller about it at all? Did you consult with him? Uh, we we consulted. We talked on a lot of different issues. Um, I'll, I'll say once I became a free agent and came to New York and I was the highest paid guy in the game, there was, we had to strike because owners, I'll, I'll have to think of which issue at the time it was, but we had to strike. I'm the highest paid guy in the game and everybody would come to me, the media, Dave, what are you guys going to do? We're going to walk out and I'm going to take a vacation a little bit and we're all in this together. And Marvin at the time and, and, and Don Fear, uh, I mean, we had plenty of conversations. In fact, there was a conversation when I left San Diego, I had, I had made a commitment to buy a certain amount of tickets for the kids. It was part of my foundation. Mm -hmm. And the last year we were unable to completely fulfill it. Uh, so we had to have discussions, not just with agents and the team, but the union would look over these issues. Um, I'll give you a, a, one of the biggest issues. Early on, you were talking about um, Kurt Flood, and he said, well-paid slave and that type of stuff, and, and, it, and it really shocked the sensibilities of a lot of people around the game. 1990, when I was with the Yankees, and I had played, I don't know, at that time, 16 years or so, I was 10 with the same team, and, you know, you, they couldn't trade me. And yet they did without my consent. And I said, I'm not going. And when there was the big brouhaha in the locker room in Seattle, and they were, they were saying they were going to trade me, and I said, and I'm not going. Right in that same room, I said that I hearkened back to, I said, I haven't seen anything like this since Kurt Flood. <laughs> Boy, they were writing. They were writing on their pads. There was no social media back then. Yeah. But they said, "Oh my gosh, what is this?" Because they were trying to trade me improperly, illegally, in my estimation. So I flew back to New York. We went. Ultimately, we were going to have a um, media, not a mediation, but uh, yeah, we we were all going to meet uh, in New York and at the Players Association office to legally hash it out. But at the last minute, the Angels uh, said, we want to give you a, a contract, a good contract. And so, and that said, we, we avoided arbitration. Yeah, excuse me. We avoided arbitration. I said, bye. I'm going out the door. But the yeah. Players Association was totally involved. So even, uh, here's one more thing. When I retired after the 1995 season, and I got past the, the last team that I was with Cleveland. And I, um, so I was truly a free agent. And I, when I retired, I retired um, with the Players Association by my side. Mm -hmm. I wanted to retire as a player, not a particular team. And uh, that meant a lot to me. Marvin was there. Um, you know, I, I think Michael Weiner was there. Um, a lot of people, but I retired with alongside of the Players Association, not a team. Yeah, you mentioned the ten and five rule. For those not familiar, if you're a veteran player, you have been in the majors for at least ten seasons, and you have been with your current team at least five years. You can veto a trade. You have to give permission. Uh, that was a rule or that was a, a game for the players. I think it was made in 1973. And I have to guess that was Marvin's idea. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And um, fortunately, I mean, every time that the players have, have gone to battle and by nature, ownership and labor, there's going to be push and pull and the rub and fights. But uh, Marvin didn't lose any. Yeah, <laughs> he didn't lose any. Um, we always had to make it advancements. We try not to step back. Um, it's debatable on, on on one of the issues when you talk about uh, a couple of things, but not not to get specific. But we've always made advancements. The the league has gotten 
larger, more lucrative, more robust. And there's more challenges today because there's so much more money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. people don't take these collective bargaining sessions and uh, lightly. Probably the most difficult year for Marvin Miller as the head of the Players Association was 1981 because of the lengthy strike, the amount of time that he was at the negotiating table. I believe you were a player rep at the time. Did you yes. see wear and tear on him having to, to go through not only negotiating with the owners, but meeting the press every day too? Oh, and, and making sure your players are still on the same page. Yeah. Sometimes people get nervous. No money's coming in. What are we going to do? When are we going to go back? And I'll tell you, we those, I, I don't know with Marvin, there's always stress and pressure. You're representing a thousand players, a thousand lives, a thousand families. Now it's even more. You know, with the 40 man rosters and 30 teams, you got 1,200 guys. And Tony Clark, think of the, you know, the, the stresses and strains that he has to go to, uh, go through. And um, I saw, here's the key thing there are so many player leaders. Boy, we would have some fierce discussions behind the scenes <laughs> really <laughs> I, I can't I can't even tell you I can't even use the words I can't tell you the width and breadth and depth of these discussions but players would have to either rein themselves in or motivate themselves oh believe me and uh, those are very interesting you would have loved to be a fly on the wall <laughs> yeah but uh, there are guys, you know, if the knees got weak, oh, what are we going to do? Uh, stay strong. <laughs> uh, I've been part of some of those discussions as well. Yeah, uh, sure. I, I have to laugh. Um, one, uh, one time I had the, the mic, so to speak, and then when I finished and, and tried to, you know, rein the guys back in and bring some order to this, I remember Eddie Murray was there. He said, Thank you for that, Reverend Winfield. <laughs> I mean, so and then everybody would laugh. But nevertheless, the players kind of managed themselves. And Marvin, uh, soft-spoken, many, like, again, he said he never really raised his voice. He just said, these are some of the options. If you do this, this might happen. If you don't proceed with this, this could happen. And then guys would figure it out. Final question for Hall of Famer Dave Winfield. Without Marvin Miller, is there any way that you could imagine how your career in baseball would have turned out differently? Would it have been so different that it would have been unrecognizable? Um, without a union, <laughs> I, I can't tell you where my career would have been. I would have been uh, stifled, held back, couldn't have earned, made a living couldn't have become who I am today with the opportunities in front of me. And Marvin was the leader. He handed it off to Don Fear, and he led, you know, for another, oh, I don't know how many years, I'll say 15 or whatever. And then it was handed off to Michael Weiner, very sharp lawyer. And then it's handed off to Tony Clark when, when Michael passed away, unfortunately, way too soon. And I, I had a good relationship with all of these people. And without their knowledge, commitment, more or less seamless handoffs. There was one handoff to a, a guy that the players hired, and he, he just he didn't fit, and he was gone. In a year, he was gone. But with the four that have been there, um, I can't imagine. My life my career would have been totally different, which means my life had, would have a different trajectory. So I'm eternally thankful uh, for Marvin. I, I told him that uh, we talked within a couple of weeks of his passing. Mm -hmm. And he was older and weakened and everything else. But I definitely thanked him for all he did. And, um, and so, I, again, when he went in the Hall of Fame this year, Understand, I had, a, I had a tear in my eye. I was out here in Los Angeles. I heard the vote, and I was, yeah, because he deserved it long ago. And sometimes voting can be skewed for different reasons. I was no finger pointing, but Marvin deserved it a long time ago. 
unfortunately he didn't see it when he was alive and um but he was the man he deserves it all the praise for our our industry goes to him started with him Dave, we really appreciate your, your comments, uh, your poignant thoughts on Marvin Miller. Thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure. Again, that's Hall of Famer Dave Winfield talking about the late Marvin Miller, part of the Hall of Fame's class of 2020. Won't have a ceremony this year, but uh, we want to have one next year, 2021. And we expect, Dave, you'll be there as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. We hope you've enjoyed this uh, virtual Legends of the Game program. Dave Winfield talking about fellow Hall of Famer Marvin Miller. Thanks for being with us. Have a great day, everybody.